Thank you, everybody. I apologize for being a couple minutes late. Um, we are now ready to reconvene for the chikungunya vaccine session, and we will start with an introduction and overview by Dr. Beth Bell, who was chair of the ACIP work group. Dr. Bell? Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, so chikungunya, as I'm sure most of you know, is a mosquito-borne viral disease, which um, is characterized by an acute onset of fever and severe uh, and can be debilitating um, polyarthralgia. Um, the um, work group on chikungunya vaccines uh, was formed um, recently. Um, no chikungunya vaccine uh, has ever been licensed in the United States or globally, but there are multiple chikungunya vaccines in development. And uh, one manufacturer, um, initiated rolling su submission of a BLA um, to the Food and Drug Administration in August of um, this year, and licensure is possible um, during 2023. And so the work group was formed in um, May of uh, this year. Next. So um, the chikungunya vaccines work group will uh, review and evaluate data on chikungunya disease, on the epidemiology, and on vaccines. And uh, we will work to develop policy options for ACIP's consideration for US persons at risk of chikungunya, including travelers and residents of US territories and states with or at risk of transmission. Next. Um, on this um, slide are uh, the terms of reference for the work group. And I'll just read through them. Um, first of all, to review information on chikungunya disease, including outcomes. To review data on chikungunya epidemiology and burden among, among US residents, which includes travelers and persons living in areas at risk for local transmission. To review data on safety, immunogenicity, and effectiveness of chikungunya vaccines to provide evidence-based recommendation options for ACIP, to identify areas in need of further research for informing potential future vaccine recommendations and to publish a chikungunya vaccine MMWR uh, recommendations and reports um, document. Next. So this, uh, these are the uh, work group members. Um, ACIP members include myself and um, Dr. Wilbur Chen. Uh, the CDC lead is Susan Hills and the deputy is Nicole Lindsay, both from the Division of uh, Vector-Borne Diseases. Um, we have um, ex officio members from the FDA and from the NIH and uh, ACIP li liaisons from the um, Society of Travel Medicine, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Family Medicine and a um, wide array of invited consultants which bring uh, who bring um, diverse and, and very deep uh, expertise um, to address these questions. Next, please. Um, these are the CDC participants, uh, including um, other um, people who work in the vector borne diseases di division, um, other parts of um, the, uh, that center, also the global immunization division, the immunization safety group, and um, uh, members uh, that uh, are helping us with GRADE and uh, liaison with the ACIP Secretariat. Next. So today's session um, will be, I believe actually this is the first time the ACIP will have heard about chikungunya. Um, so we will uh, start with an overview of chikungunya disease and vaccines by Dr. Susan Hills. Um, followed by a presentation by um, the manufacturer Valneva. Um, uh, Dr. Katrin Dubishar will uh, present on the immunization and safety of Valneva's chikungunya vaccine. And then Dr. Hills will come back and provide um, the work group interpretation of the vaccine data and uh, our plans and timelines. Uh, next, I think that's it for my comments. Next, is there another one? Yeah, okay, so thanks very much. And um, I think Dr. Hills is up next. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Dr. Hills, we'll pull up your presentation.
Um, so, uh, thank you, Dr. Bell, very much for the introduction, and, and thank you, Dr. Lee. Chikungunya is a mosquito-borne disease caused by chikungunya virus, which is an alpha virus. The disease is characterized clinically by the acute onset of fever and often severe polyarthralgia. The virus has caused large, outbra large outbreaks with high attack rates. During such outbreaks, from one third to three quarters of the local populations have been affected. Outbreaks have occurred in most parts of the world, including in Africa, Asia, Europe, the Americas, and islands in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Chikungunya virus was first identified in Tanzania in the 1950s, and the name chikungunya is derived from a word in the local language in the area the outbreak occurred. And it means that which bends up, which refers to the stoop posture of individuals infected with the virus. Over the next 50 years, cases and outbreaks occurred sporadically in parts of Africa and Asia. Beginning in 2004, there was a large increase in the number of chikungunya cases reported from India and islands in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Imported cases also resulted in outbreaks in temperate areas of Europe. In late 2013, the first local transmission of chikungunya virus in the Americas was identified, and the virus subsequently spread through most of the Americas, with more than 2.6 million cases ultimately reported during the outbreak. In association with this outbreak, there was widespread transmission in the US territories of Puerto Rico and US Virgin Islands, and also some limited local transmission in the continental United States, with 13 cases reported in the states of Florida and Texas. This map shows the countries and territories where past or current transmission of chikungunya virus has been reported as of 2022. The rapid spread of the virus and recent large outbreaks have essentially driven development of chikungunya vaccines. Chikungunya cases among US travelers have primarily reflected chikungunya virus transmission patterns in the region of the Americas. Before 2013, chikungunya was not a common travel-related disease, but when chikungunya emerged in the Americas, there was a sharp increase in cases, with almost 3,000 traveler cases reported during 2014 alone. In the years since, there has subsequently been a steady decline in cases. Future chikungunya outbreaks are likely to occur, although it's difficult to predict, predict when and where these might be the greatest risk for travelers will be when these epidemics occur. The mosquitoes that spread chikungunya virus to humans are Aedes stegomyia species mosquitoes, primarily Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. They are active daytime biters with peak activity at dusk and dawn. They lay their eggs in containers that hold water, such as buckets and flower pots. In addition to mosquito-borne transmission, other uncommon modes of chikungunya virus transmission that have been documented um, include intrauterine and intrapartum transmission, blood-borne transmission through needle stick injury, and transmission through aerosol exposure in the laboratory. The clinical symptoms of chikungunya typically develop about three to seven days following the bite uh, from an infected mosquito with the majority of infected persons developing symptoms. The most common symptoms of disease are a high fever and arthralgia, which is typically severe and can be debilitating. Other symptoms can also occur, such as maculopapular rash, myalgia, and headache. The joint symptoms usually involve multiple joints, and they typically is a bilateral and symmetric pattern. The joint pains occur most commonly in the hands and feet, but they can also affect more proximal joints. There is no specific antiviral treatment for symptoms, and the approach to management typically involves rest, fluids, and use of analgesics and antipyretics. Although rare, serious complications of chikungunya can occur, such as myocarditis, ocular disease, including uveitis or retinitis, hepatitis, acute renal disease, severe bullous lesions in infants, 
and neurologic disease such as meningoencephalitis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, myelitis, or cranial nerve palsies. Deaths are very rare, uh, but can occur. Some groups of people have an increased risk for more severe disease. This includes adults over, uh, older than 65 years of age and people with underlying medical conditions, such as hypertension, diabetes, or heart disease. Pregnant women have symptoms and outcomes similar to other people, but intrapartum transmission can result in neonatal complications, including neurologic or myocardial disease or hemorrhagic symptoms. For many people with chikungunya, symptoms resolve in about seven to 10 days. However, some have ongoing joint pain and prolonged fatigue for months or years after their acute illness. The exact proportion of people with persistent symptoms is difficult to define. There are more than 50 studies on the topic, but the study results show substantial variability related to a variety of factors, including the study methodology, such as whether it was prospective or a retrospective study, um, and whether they included an uninfected comparison group. The duration of follow-up, the means of ascertaining symptoms, the cohorts, cohorts assessed, such as whether they were drawn from the community, hospitalised patients, or from the traveller population. The demographics of the patients included and other factors. At a future ACIP meeting, the work group will present more information on this topic as disease sequelae are very important to understanding the potential benefits of vaccination. Factors that appear to be associated with more prolonged symptoms include older age, the severity of acute illness, and the presence of pre-existing joint disease. At the present time, the main means of prevention for chikungunya is the use of protective measures against mosquito bites, including insect repellent. There are no licensed chikungunya vaccines, either in the US or globally, but if a chikungunya vaccine is licensed, it will be a measure to provide additional benefit for some persons. There are many chikungunya vaccines in various stages of development, including the two shown on this slide that have completed um, or have in progress phase three clinical trials and will possibly be licensed in the United States. Valneva's vaccine, which you will hear more about today, is shown in the first row um, and is the furthest advanced. The vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine and the schedule is one dose administered intramuscularly. A phase three study in adults 18 years and older has been completed and a phase three study in adolescents 12 to 17 years of age commenced in January this year. A lot to lot consistency study has also been completed. Emergent Biosolutions also has a chikungunya vaccine in late stage development and that's shown in the second row. This is a virus-like particle or VLP vaccine and the schedule also is one dose admin administered intramuscularly. A phase three trial among adults and adolescents aged 12 to 65 years commenced in October 2021 and a phase three trial among adults aged 65 years and older commenced in May 2022. Also of note on this slide is that Valneva's vaccine has received co-funding from CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. CEPI is a global partnership working to accelerate the development of vaccines against epidemic diseases. Chikungunya vaccine was selected for prioritization by CEPI in recognition of the disease's public health risk and global economic impact. And Valneva's vaccine is one of three chikungunya vaccine candidates that CEPI is supporting. The other two chikungunya vaccine candidates that CEPI is supporting are shown on this slide. Um, the first is the Merck vaccine, originally from Temis Bioscience, which is a live attenuated measles vectored vaccine. The schedule is expected to be one primary dose and a booster, and phase two trials have been completed. The other vaccine is being developed in a collaboration between the International Vaccine Institute in Korea and Bharat Biotech in India, and is an inactivated whole virus vaccine. It's administered in a two-dose schedule, and a phase two, three trial was commenced in August 2021. In regards to Valneva's vaccine, Valneva initiated a rolling submission of their BLA to FDA in August 2022, and the submission is targeted for completion by the end of this year. 
FDA has given the vaccine a breakthrough therapy designation, which allows a request for a priority review. Its expected vaccine licensure will occur during 2023 with an initial indication for adults aged 18 years and older. So in summary, chikungunya is a mosquito-borne disease that can cause large outbreaks, particularly in tropical and subtropical regions. In the United States, there have been previous outbreaks in territories and limited local transmission in two states. The likelihood and scale of any future outbreaks in areas of the US with the Aedes mosquito vectors is unknown, but given the expansion in, in the area of transmission of many other viruses in recent times, there is clear potential for transmission or outbreaks in the US in future. For travelers, the greatest risk for infection is during outbreak periods. The clinical presentation of disease is with fever and often severe polyarthralgia, and there is a risk for long-term joint symptoms. Because no chikungunya vaccine has previously been licensed, there are no existing ACIP chikungunya vaccine recommendations, so the work group will be discussing potential recommendation options for ACIP's consideration for travelers and residents of US territories and states with or at risk of transmission. Before I conclude, I wanted to present some brief information on the accelerated approval pathway, which we use for licensure of chikungunya vaccines, um, because it's relevant for Valneva's presentation that will follow. Under FDA regulations, several licensure pathways are available for new vaccines, with the most appropriate pathway depending on the type of evidence that can be generated to demonstrate the vaccine's effectiveness. The three pathways are traditional approval, accelerated approval, and the animal rule. Traditional approval can occur through an efficacy trial with a disease endpoint, human challenge studies, or immunogenicity studies. Randomized controlled field efficacy, efficacy trials would be challenging for chikungunya vaccine because outbreaks are unpredictable and their duration can be uh, relatively short. As a result, this approach uh, would be logistically very challenging and clinical development would likely be substantially delayed if this approach was necessary. Human challenge studies can generally be justified in adults when there is assurance that the challenge infection will be self-limited or complications can be easily managed without sequelae. The main concern with this approach for chikungunya vaccine is that while most cases resolve without complications, some patients get persistent debilitating arthralgia and no treatment is available. So this approach is unlikely to be ethically justifiable. The third approach, immunogenicity studies, can be used where there is an established correlative protection from disease. For chikungunya, several animal and human studies have suggested that protection is primarily mediated by chikungunya virus neutralizing antibodies. However, a protective threshold for neutralizing antibody titers has not been definitively established. FDA can grant accelerated approval for products that are for serious conditions and that fill an unmet medical need. This pathway is designed to bring products for serious conditions to market faster. Demonstration of effectiveness for accelerated approval is based on controlled clinical trials showing the vaccine has an effect on a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. This is slightly different to traditional approval where effectiveness is assessed directly. With accelerated approval, there is a post-licensure requirement for controlled trials to confirm the clinical benefit. The approach for accelerated approval of chikungunya vaccines was endorsed at an FDA Verbach meeting in November 2019. The marker of protection that can be used for accelerated approval of chikungunya vaccines is based on a neutralizing antibody titer estimated from a validated non-human primate model. Dr. Dubashar will be describing Valneva's model in her presentation that will follow mine. As I mentioned earlier, with the accelerated approval pathway, effectiveness will need to be confirmed in a phase four post-licensure field study. So thank you very much for your attention, um, and I will hand back to Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hills. Um, are there any uh, quick questions or clarifications people would like to ask Dr. Hills? I 
I don't see any, any hands raised in the moment. Uh, so we'll move on. Oh, sorry, Dr. Chen. Dr. Hills, thank you for that presentation and the introduction to chikungunya. I just wanted clarification for the uh, risk factors for severe disease. You, you mentioned age, underlying medical conditions, for example, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease. I imagine that that's a pretty large swath right there. Uh, there wasn't specific mention of the immunocompromised, but I'm assuming that that's also a risk as well. But maybe you could comment a little bit more about underlying medical conditions, because that would be a large uh, portion of, of a population, any population. Um, is, it, is it just a relative increase, or uh, can you describe a little bit more about this risk in populations with chick? Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, so there have been various studies that look at more um, severe disease, and, and as you know, immunocompromise is um, a condition as well uh, as it is for almost all uh, infections, so it's not mentioned there specifically. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's a little bit of an overlap because older disease, as well as some of these underlying medical conditions, often occur within, within the same um, uh, group. So, um, you know, particularly if, you, if you're looking at that, that disease severity, it is those older adults who are also the ones with a variety of underlying medical conditions that are really showing up in the studies as those um, uh, with most at, at risk of severe disease. Um, the other the other issue, of course, is it, it's it's like a, a U-shaped curve with with severity because in addition to those groups, there is a neonates. Um, if there is intrapartum transmission, um, then there really is very severe disease among uh, those very young infants and neonates born to mothers who are viremic during pregnancy, um, with things like uh, myocardial myocardial disease, um, with neurologic manifestations, with hematologic. Um, um, issues, so, so you know, uh, which can lead to things like cerebral hemorrhage. So that there, there's those um, two specific groups, but but as you mentioned, with that sort of overlap in that older age group, particularly with often both older plus underlying medical conditions. So I guess to clarify, um, the uh, younger adult that may have well-controlled hypertension may not be among the, the the types of people that would be at the extremely high risk of severe chikungunya necessarily, uh, to, to think about the, the population more of, uh, w with cumulative multiple comorbidities and old age as, as kind of the population at risk, or the intrapartum population. Yeah, uh, th so there has been studies that have independently suggested um, these underlying medical conditions, putting people at uh, increased risk of se severe chikungunya. Um, but again, sort of um, a, a younger person with, with well-controlled hypertension is probably at far lower risk of, of severe disease than the older person with, uh, you know, not well-controlled um, hypertension. So thanks for that clarification. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Yeah, um, thank you for the presentation. And a naive question, but how do you get outbreaks of an arbor-born or vector-born um, Infection. I mean, is it just a large number of people in the population have it and then the ADs bites them and spreads it to other people? Um, yeah, so that, that's an interesting question. When um, uh, the, the outbreak sort of spread through the um, Indian and Pacific Oceans, for example, um, or in, back in 2004, there was a slight viral mutation that led to um, increased uh, ability of the Aedes albopictus mosquito to transmit. And um, this meant that um, Aedes albopictus Pictus has um, more distribution in temperate areas. Aedes aegypti tends to st stick to um, tropical and subtropical areas. So you're getting um, transmission by a vector in areas where people are non-immune. Overall, in terms of outbreaks, there's a variety of factors that can lead to outbreaks. They can be uh, population immunity, so getting to a critical point where there's insufficient population immunity. There can be um, genetics, it can be environmental conditions. Um, there can be a variety of factors, which is why we can never um, predict specifically when and where we might see the next outbreak. Thank you. Any other questions? 
All right, we will move on to uh, Dr. Dubashar from Valneva. Um, Dr. Dubashar, we'll pull up your slides or... Okay, all set, thank you. Thank you, wonderful. Um, just to make sure that everybody can hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can hear you just fine, thank you. Wonderful. So it's a pleasure to be here today and present data for our VLA 1553 chikungunya vaccine candidate. Next slide, please. My presentation today will start with a brief introduction to our vaccine candidate. I will then summarize the evidence that is supporting the serological endpoint we have defined together with the FDA for our vaccine candidate. And then conclude with our clinical study overview and key immunogenicity and safety data. Next slide, please. Our vaccine candidate, VLA-1515-3, is a live attenuated vaccine candidate uh, used in a single dose in intramuscular immunization, and it comes in a lyophilized presentation. The vaccine candidate is based on the La Réunion strain of uh, the East Central South African genotype of uh, chikungunya virus, and its attenuation has been achieved uh, through reverse genetics, and the virus carries a 60 amino acid deletion in the non-structural protein 3 um, that reduces its uh, replication capacity against the wild type virus. The target populations uh, that uh, we see for this vaccine is on the one hand side in non-endemic countries or Western countries where the vaccine can play a role in travelers, as well as in military and in outbreak preparedness, uh, for example, in countries like the United States, Europe or Canada. Uh, of course, there is also a big burden in low and middle income countries where uh, chikungunya virus uh, is endemic. And in those regions, we are partnered with uh, CEPI as uh, Dr. Hills has commented and uh, worked together with Instituto Butantan from Brazil to make the vaccine affordable. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide summarizes the evidence uh, we have generated in support of the serological endpoint used in our phase three clinical trial program. Uh, in brief, we have transferred human post-vaccination sera from our phase one clinical study to non-human primates um, at varying titer levels and have then challenged these animals with the wild type chikungunya virus. Following the challenge, they have been monitored for the development of uh, fever and also for development of uh, viremia. The protocol for this study has been agreed with the FDA. The results uh, have been published by now. Um, to summarize the group that has received uh, human post-vaccination serum, we have not seen fever developing in those non-human primates, uh, whereas the fever is typically developed in the non-human primates that receive non-immune serum. We have not been able to detect any live replicating virus in any of those non-human primates, and in all of the animals, the viral load was strongly reduced in some animals, even undetectable. And uh, this was depending on the tighter before the wild type virus challenge. So with those data, we've been able to determine a pre-challenge titer that resulted in sterilizing immunity in the non-human primates. And uh, this uh, titer cutoff has been selected um, to be to meet the definition of zero response. Um, so a zero response is uh, defined as a titer of greater or equal to 150 in a micro plaque reduction neutralization test. In addition uh, to these to this evidence coming from the non-human primate model, there is also some supportive evidence uh, from a prospective seroepidemiological study that has been conducted in the Philippines. Uh, this was a trial where they were following up a cohort and monitoring them for acute febrile illness. In this trial, uh, the uh, uh, neutralizing antibody titer of 10 in a micropure assay has been associated with protection from development of chikungunya virus fever. The, we were able to get a panel of CIRA from that trial and uh, the titer they have observed in that study would translate to a micropurity 50 of about 50 in our assay system. Um, therefore also supporting the selected uh, response titer of 150. Next slide, please. Um, next one, please. 
This is an overview of our clinical study program. We have uh, three clinical trials that provide data for the initial licensure. A phase one clinical study conducted in 120 adults aged 18 to 45 years, where we were evaluating three dose levels of the vaccine and looking at safety, immunogenicity, and viremia data. And two phase three clinical trials a randomized controlled phase three clinical trial comparing our vaccine to placebo in a total of uh, 4,115 participants and a lot-to-lot -lot consistency study in 408 participants. Next slide, please. This summarizes the study design from our phase one clinical trial. As I mentioned, 120 healthy volunteers aged 18 to 45 years were immunized uh, with three dose levels of the vaccine, approximately uh, a virus titer of 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth, and 10 to the fifth, TCID 50. A low and medium dose uh, groups contained 30 participants each, and the high dose group consisted of 60 participants. All these groups were immunized on study day zero, and uh, development for viremia was monitored on days 3, 7, 14 post-vaccination, and further study visits took place on day 29 and out a follow-up until month 12. Half of the high-dose group received another dose of the vaccine at month 6, and all other study participants received another dose at month 12, and we used those immunizations with the live vaccine uh, as uh, equaling a, an intrinsic uh, viral challenge. Next slide, please. That's a brief summary of the results. Uh, the data have been published in Lancet ID. Uh, we have seen a very good immunogenicity profile. We have been able to select the medium dose for further development based on the study. Uh, zero conversion was observed in all individuals in the trial in all those groups. And uh, when we applied the zero response threshold to that study, we have also seen 100% zero response at day 14 in all those groups. We've seen that neutralizing antibodies were retained in all participants at month 12. Uh, I've mentioned before the revaccinations that were administered either at month six or at month 12. And we have seen that following these revaccinations, there was no anamnestic neutralizing antibody response, uh, which shows that the single dose was in fish in sufficient to induce a sustained high titer of neutralizing antibodies, and we didn't need another vaccination. And also, we were able to show that uh, there was no vaccine-induced viremia after the revaccination, and we also didn't see any uh, associated clinical symptoms, so no reactogenicity after the revaccinations, which we take as an early indication that the antibodies induced to the immunization at day zero uh, efficiently neutralized uh, the vaccine virus upon revaccination. With those data, we were able uh, to skip a phase two study. We didn't need to generate further dose and schedule data and were able to advance immediately into phase three clinical trials. Next slide, please. Our pivotal clinical study design. Um, this is a multicenter randomized placebo controlled trial conducted in the United States. Uh, we enrolled adults aged 18 years and above with no upper age limit. The primary endpoint was the proportion of participants with zero response for individuals who were negative at baseline for chikungunya virus neutralizing antibodies. The threshold agreed with the FDA for uh, acceptance of the data from that study was that the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval for the zero response rate needed to exceed 70% for the study to meet its endpoint. In terms of safety, we've been uh, capturing unsolicited adverse events for six months and uh, solicited adverse events for 10 days following vaccination. Recruitment was stratified by age, uh, 18 to 64 years, about uh, 3,650 individuals, and older adults, about 460. And the randomization scheme was three to one for virulent and placebo groups. The first 462 participants uh, constituted the immunogenicity subset. Immunizations uh, took place on day one, uh, study visits then occurred on day eight, on day 29 for the primary endpoint, and the last follow-up visit was at month six. Next slide, please. This is the demographic data 
characteristics were similar between the VLA 1553 and the placebo groups, about 55% female and a uh, good uh, diversity and racial distribution. Mean age was about 45 years. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the primary endpoint, the zero response rate uh, over time. On day 29, which was the time point for determining the primary endpoint, the zero response was seen in 99% uh, or 263 out of 266 individuals uh, versus no zero response in the placebo group. A high zero response rate was also maintained at the month six visit with 96% showing zero response still at month six. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the kinetics of neutralizing antibody response. And um, what, you, uh, what we can see here is also the impact of age, or rather the non-impact by age. Uh, the geometric mean titles are plotted in the dark purple color for adults aged 65 years and above and then the light blue color for individuals below 65 years of age. Um, we can see the titers peaking at day 29 and then declining over time. However, they stay well above uh, the orange line, which indicates the threshold for zero response. We can also see that the two uh, titer uh, lines for the two age groups are virtually superimposed on each other, indicating that the vaccine was equally immunogenic in uh, those two age strata. Next slide, please. Um, to round up the immunogenicity data presentation, I uh, briefly want to summarize results from our lot-to-lot -lot consistency study. Um, the study was conducted in 408 adults. Uh, here, the age group was 18 to 45 years. And the primary endpoint in this trial was the geometric mean title for neutralizing antibodies on day 29 post-vaccination. Uh, the study met its primary endpoint. We were able to demonstrate uh, lot to lot consistency. And the zero response was seen in 98% of participants on day 28 and then 96% at day 180. Therefore, the immunogenicity profile seen in those individuals uh, is uh, consistent with the pivotal study. Next slide, please. I'll now move on to a presentation of safety data. Next one, please. This is a summary of adverse event rates observed in the VLA 1553-301 study. About 62% of individuals reported any adverse events in the six months following administration of VLA 1553, compared to about 45% for the placebo group. Related adverse events were observed in 51% of the VLA 1553 group. Severe adverse events were reported by 3.4% of the individuals, and 2% of the individuals reported related severe adverse events in this trial. Next slide, please. This is a graph showing the solicited local adverse events profile uh, observed for 10 days after vaccination. As we can see, about 15% overall developed local adverse events. Uh, the majority of these events were mild to moderate, and uh, about 11% in the placebo group developed uh, adverse events, local adverse events. The most common local AE was tenderness. Next slide, please. This is a summary of the solicited systemic adverse events. Overall, about 50% of the individuals developed systemic adverse events. The most common ones were headache, fatigue, and myalgia. Those were observed in more than 20% of the VLA 1553 group. And the majority of the systemic reactions were mild or moderate. About 70% developed arthralgia. Most of the reactions, as I mentioned, were mild and moderate. Uh, we have seen a number of severe reactions, and uh, mostly this was fever. Next slide, please. Uh, because chikungunya virus uh, is associated with arthralgia, we have uh, looked at post-vaccination arthralgia in more detail here. Um, on the left panel, you see a summary of the arthralgia rates observed in the clinical trial. In the VLA 1553 group, about 17% have reported any arthralgia. 
About 0.5% of these individuals or 15 individuals have reported an arthralgia with a duration exceeding 11 days, and the longest duration was 180 days. If we contrast this with the findings from the placebo group, here we have seen about 5% developing any arthralgia, uh, but also 0.5% of the placebo group reported an arthralgia with a duration exceeding 11 days, and the longest duration here was 180 days. The right-hand panel uh, shows uh, the relative frequency of arthralgia uh, by duration for the VLA-1553 group and the placebo group. And to briefly walk you through that, uh, what we can see is in the light blue, all the, the rate of arthralgia that was uh, had a duration of one to five days, followed by the dark blue with a duration of uh, six to 10 days. And then the further colors for the for the longer lasting symptoms. If you look at the uh, distribution of uh, the duration between VLA 1553 and the placebo group, uh, we see that the um, the relative frequency of longer lasting arthralgia is not increased with VLA 1553 in comparison to placebo. Next slide, please. Uh, serious adverse events, 1.5% uh, reported any serious adverse event in the VLA-1553 group versus 0.8 in the placebo group. Two related serious adverse events were reported with VLA-1553, uh, and I'll summarize those quickly. On the one hand, uh, a case of myalgia in a 50-year-old female study participant. Uh, the Onset of this event was one day after her vaccination, and uh, the individual was hospitalized for a couple of days, um, basically for diagnostic procedures. Uh, the outcome of myalgia was recovered uh, about a month later. The participant has a history of fibromyalgia, and during workup of uh, the individual case, no other trigger for the myalgia could be identified. The second case uh, was a 66-year-old male who uh, developed the syndrome of inappropriate antidiurotic hormone secretion uh, 10 days after the immunization with VLA 1553. Uh, that individual uh, was also hospitalized, also made a full recovery. And the assessment here was that the uh, syndrome of inappropriate antidiurotic hormone secretion uh, may have been related to prolonged fever symptoms post-vaccination. Next slide, please. This is a breakdown of adverse events by age, um, and I would like uh, you to focus on the two columns in the dark color shade uh, that show the adverse event rates for VLA-1553 in 18 to 64 years of age versus 65 years of age and above. Uh, we can see about 62-63% uh, reporting any adverse event uh, in the two age strata. And then if you look at the rates of related AEs severe AEs and also related severe AEs, uh, the adverse event rates appear quite comparable in the two age group, if at all a bit lower in the individuals aged 65 years and above. Next slide, please. Um, from the lot-to-lot -lot consistency data, the safety profile has also been consistent with what we've seen in the pivotal phase three study. 73% uh, of those individuals experienced any adverse events, we didn't see significant differences between lots. 61% reported solicited AEs, 19% local and 57% systemic, and also here the AEs were mostly mild or moderate. There were no related SAEs observed in this clinical trial. Next slide, please. So in summary, uh, VLA-1553, met its primary endpoint in a pivotal immunogenicity phase three study. The serological endpoint, a micropurinty titer greater or equal to 150, was agreed by the FDA to support an accelerated approval pathway. A single dose induced serial response in 99% of participants at day 29, and serial response was sustained in 96% at day 180. We have seen similar GMTs and serial response rates in older and younger adults. VLA-1553 was generally well tolerated across the age groups. We had an independent data safety monitoring board that didn't identify a safety concern. The majority of adverse events were mild or moderate and resolved within three days. 2.1% reported severe solicited AEs, and most commonly this was fever. 
The safety profile uh, is comparable with other licensed vaccines, and we have initiated the BLA submission to FDA. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. This presentation is now open for questions. I see Dr. Paling's hand raised first. All right, so first of all, thank you for this presentation. Um, I wanted to ask for some clarification. The phase one trial, as I understood it, was healthy persons 18 to 45. And then you went on to the VLA 1553 trial. And that did have age diversity, and it definitely had um, race diversity. Um, did it include persons with um, medical conditions? Thank you. Yes, so the requirements from the protocol in terms of um, in an exclusion criteria were that the individuals had to have had to be generally healthy uh, based on their medical history, physical examination, and screening laboratory tests. And what we allowed was for individuals, uh, for example, they could have had a chronic illness or a chronic condition like hypertension or diabetes or hyperlipidemia if that was stable and well controlled on therapy for the past six months. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Thanks so much for that um, uh, overview of the clinical development um, for this vaccine. I, I have a, a question that kind of uh, dovetails with Dr. Paling's, which is um, it, you confirmed that um, the, the pivotal phase three was predominantly healthy adults, and we only had, I think, less than 12% of that pivotal uh, trial including older adults, uh, those 65 years and older. Uh, I don't know if you have the ranges of those ages, because it, it seems to be just so few in number, and then um, really just understanding how far uh, you, you looked at age effects. And what I'm get really getting at is, is really if there could be uh, an understanding of the immune response among others uh, who have uh, chronic medical conditions, um, who are immunocompromised, it also appears that you didn't uh, do studies in pregnant women, which is another target population. I think you know the reason Dr. Hills, it was important for me to understand risk was, was to understand which populations we would like to protect with vaccination. So trying to understand um, which, which uh, parts of the population have been studied with this phase three. And also you have a commitment for post-licensure requirement for controlled trials. Um, so again, are those uh, being planned or maybe being implemented right now um, in which you're doing uh, those types of studies, uh, looking at the immune response and safety in immunocompromised or pregnant women or uh, other adults with um, chronic medical conditions? Um. Okay, let me let me start maybe by by addressing one of the questions about the the age span included in our clinical trial. The, the pivotal phase three, the oldest individual that received VLA fifteen fifty three was eighty eight years of age, and I think overall we have um, a, a, yeah a couple of hundred people of this age stratum. Um, we do have a full breakdown also of uh, the underlying medical conditions the individuals had. Uh, for example, we have about 19% uh, of the individuals in the study had a medical history of hypertension. Uh, we are in the process of looking at uh, data further stratified by um, individuals who take um, any immune modifying medications, for example, from our clinical study. So there's a couple of things we're looking at in addition at the moment. Um, when it comes to uh, to pregnant women, um, no, this has not been included uh, in, in our clinical trial. We have had uh, an exclusion criterion relating to, to pregnancy as um, this is really the first, uh, first large study of this uh, vaccine candidate. And um, we felt that it's, uh, it would have been too early to study pregnant women at this stage. When it comes to the development post-marketing, um, Dr. Hills has explained the, the difficulties and logistical boundaries of implementing effectiveness or efficacy phase three type of clinical trial settings. Um, so we are in the process of determining together with the FDA and other regulatory agencies, what the best way of uh, demonstrating 
vaccine effectiveness is. Uh, most likely this will be in an uh, observational study setting in an area where the vaccine, where the virus uh, circulates, uh, so in endemic areas. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Uh, yeah, thanks so much. I have two questions. My first is um, around the persistence of the antibody titers, and it seemed that that was longer than I would expect, and does that suggest anything about replication of the virus or sort of persistence of the virus after a single dose? So the I think the, the antibody response lasting out long, um, we, we have seen that with other live attenuated vaccines where there's a precedence of very long lasting immunity after immunization. And uh, also if you look at the natural infection with chikungunya virus, this is considered to confer lifelong immunity. Um, we have also looked at, uh, at viremia and we see a complete resolution of viremia at day 14 uh, and also our, so there's no concerns from our side into that perspective. Okay, thanks. And then I had a safety question, which was 17% arthralgia in the vaccinated population. Um, could you just describe what that was for those participants? What, you know, how bad, how long, um, that kind of thing. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the, the majority of the arthralgia cases was, was mild. Um, that was 14% uh, of the individuals reported mild arthralgia. 3% reported moderate arthralgia and 0.3% uh, reported severe arthralgia. Uh, severe would have been inability to, to perform their daily chores. So this was uh, you know, a handful of cases only. Um, the duration in terms of uh, mean duration of the arthralgia observed in the VLA 1553 uh, participants, the mean duration was five days. In the placebo recipients, uh, the mean duration of those with arthralgia was 8.8 .8 days. Um, that, is, that is a bit of the color that I can share uh, when you look at that comparison. Thank you. Ms. Bata? Thank you. Um, I just had a question related to um, the live attenuated strain that you're using and whether it was <clears throat> specific um, or if there was any cross protection um, to, to other strains. So the vaccine, so chikungunya in general is, is believed to be present as, as one serotype, even though there are multiple genotypes of the virus. Um, the data we have been uh, able to generate so far are uh, heterologous neutralization. So we see that the um, vaccine-induced antibodies also neutralize uh, viruses from other chikungunya genotypes. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to the pregnancy question. Um, I know you didn't. You have not looked at it. Pregnancy was an exclusion criteria, and you didn't um, study those. Um, did, first of all, that any of the women during the study became pregnant, and second of all, have you done any studies in in your in like animal studies? Um, my understanding from your animal studies and, and actually that is a live attenuated. Um, well, that it is a live attenuated vaccine, but no. You didn't see any replication, replicating virus. And so theoretically, um, could you comment on potential safety of such vaccine and, and pregnancy? And then my second question was, of these arthritis, how many were, were there frank arthritis as well? Dr. Sanchez, sorry, you were, sentence, you um, were breaking up in the second part of your question. I'm sorry, the second question was of the arthralgia, but 17% seems quite high. Um, was there any frank arthritis? Okay, got it. Um, so on the, uh, maybe let me start with the first part of the question with the pregnancies. Um, yes, there have been pregnancies reported during the study. Uh, there were some miscarriages. There were some healthy babies. We have... Uh, looked at the percentages and uh, this is not really very different from what we would observe to see in the general population. 
The animal studies, we have uh, conducted pre- and post-natal uh, toxicity studies, and uh, those did not show uh, a signal, any alarming signal. On the, um, on the question of whether any of these were arthritis, uh, no, there, were, there was one individual that reported arthralgia and arthritis, um, and she had a genetic uh, predisposition marker for the development of, of arthritis. But in most of the uh, events, these are really just reported arthralgias, uh, solicited adverse event arthralgias. And um, I just want to maybe add a, a bit of color to your comment on the, the that the rate appears to be high. Um, it's uh, it's actually also seen with with other vaccines that are you know non-life vaccines um, and have nothing um, kind of are, are not derived from an arthrogenic virus and uh, where the viremia uh, no where the arthralgia rates are reported in a in a similar range in the prescribing informations. So it Thank is uh, not not unseen. Thank you. And is um, and follow up, follow up with the pregnancy question. Was there any attempt to see whether the vaccine um, virus actually uh, got into the fetus during any of those um, episodes? No, uh, no, this was not attempted, and this included also pregnancies that were received uh, that were uh, conceived uh, a while after the immunization. So um, I think this is very little data uh, that is present at the moment in in regarding use in pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Yeah, I want to applaud you for including older adults as many times that we have a vaccine um, with the intention to use in older adults and don't actually test it in older adults. So thank you. Um, along the lines of Dr. Chen's question, can you tell me the median age of those over 65 years of age? I know you had some that were much older, but I'm trying to figure out how many were much older. And two, can you tell me anything about the frailty of these folks? Thanks. For the median age, I think we need to come back uh, to the panel on this one. Um, this is a number of that I do not have uh, readily at hand. Uh, the frailty, is, is, uh, well, as well as commented before, they uh, there were individuals that were uh, having multiple conditions, but they were uh, well enough to be included in the study, to participate in the study. And they were also, uh, if they required treatment, they were on chronic stable treatment or uh, didn't have um, progressive diseases. So um, I believe it would be a fair summary to say that it's a, a healthy older adult population, but not necessarily a very frail population. Um, I just want to clarify, frailty does not um, depend just on medical issues. So. Um, it is helpful in future to actually measure the level of frailty in these folks. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Dr. Paley? Um, I wanted to follow up on the questions about pregnancy because we know that pregnancy is an increase, is a very high risk condition for this illness. And one, um, and one of the challenges we have is this population usually gets studied really late. And so I'd encourage you to do some non human primate studies in, um, with pregnancy so that there's additional information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I don't see any additional hands raised. So um, let's move on to Dr. Hills's last presentation and then we'll wrap up this session. Dr. Hills. Maybe while we are waiting for Dr. Hills, I can just answer the last question that 70.3 was the mean age of the older age group in the trial. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, uh, Dr. Lee. So the work group has conducted an initial review of the immunogenicity and safety data and will be reviewing the data in far more depth as we move ahead. However, today I will provide a brief review of the key aspects of the vaccine data and a summary of the work group's initial conclusions. And I'll begin with the uh, immunogenicity data. So as you heard, the pivotal phase three study was a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind trial in adults aged 18 years and older. Subjects were seronegative at baseline, and seroresponse was defined as chikungunya virus neutralizing antibody titer of 150 or higher by a 50% micro-PRNT test, which was based on the value from the validated non-human primate model. 
For the immunogenicity component, 462 subjects were enrolled overall. However, the immunogenicity analysis was based on the per protocol population who were subjects with no major protocol deviations. And so there were 362 subjects, or 78% of all enrolled subjects in the analysis, including 266 vaccine recipients and 96 placebo recipients. The trial was conducted during the COVID-19 pandemic and more than half of the protocol deviations were related to attendance at study visits. The key overall results were that the zero response at 28 days was 99% with a geometric mean titer or GMT of 3,362 and at six months the rate was 96% with a GMT of 752. When Ciro's response rates were compared between younger adults aged 18 to 64 years and older adults 65 years and over, um, at 28 days, the Ciro response rates were 99% and 100% for the two groups, respectively. And at six months, the rates were 97% and 95%. The GMTs were similar in the two age groups at both time points. The other phase three study was a lot-to-lot -lot consistency study which gathered immunogenicity from uh, data from approximately 350 adults aged 18 to 45 years. In this study, the key results were that the zero response rate at 28 days was 98% and at six months was 96%. So the key points the work group noted from the review of the data are that there are a total of approximately 620 adults with immunogenicity data gathered in two phase three trials. The zero response rates at 28 days post-vaccination were high, 98% or higher, and at six months remained high at 96%. There were similar zero response rates in older and younger adults, although the data among older subjects are limited as they are based on only 59 individuals. I'll now summarise and discuss the work group interpretation of the safety data. So the key study was again the pivotal phase three study that was a randomised placebo controlled double blind trial in adults and the placebo was phosphate buffered saline. Recruitment was in a three to one ratio, so 3,082 adults received vaccine and 1,033 received placebo, and all these subjects were included in the safety population. Overall, 89% of subjects were aged 18 to 64 years, and the remaining 11%, or about 346 participants, were aged 65 years and older. Overall, 62% of vaccine recipients reported any adverse event compared with 45% of placebo recipients. 51% of events were considered by study investigators to be related adverse events, and 2% of vaccinated subjects had a, had a related severe adverse event. In all these categories, the rates among the vaccine group were significantly higher than rates among the placebo group. In regards to solicited local reactions within 10 days after vaccination, any reported local adverse event occurred in 15% of vaccine recipients, which was a similar to the rate of 11% among placebo recipients. Tenderness was the most commonly reported event, reported by 11% of subjects, and other reactions, including pain, erythema, induration, and swelling, were reported by 6% or fewer vaccine recipients. For solicited systemic reactions reported within 10 days after vaccination, 50% of vaccine recipients reported an adverse event compared, to, uh, compared with 27% of placebo recipients. The rate of severe systemic adverse events was 2% in vaccine recipients, with no severe events reported among placebo recipients. The most common systemic adverse events among placebo recipients were headache, fatigue and myalgia, and all were reported at rates of about 25 to 30%. One of the adverse events that the work group is particularly interested in is arthralgia. As Dr. Dubashar noted, that's a key feature of chikungunya disease, and this is a live attenuated vaccine. So it is, a, is a, a, an event that the work group is, is particularly interested in. Overall, arthralgia was reported by 17% or 514 vaccine recipients compared with 5% of placebo recipients. 
The severity of arthralgia among these 514 subjects was mild in 83%, moderate in 16%, and severe in 2%. The duration until resolution of arthralgia after vaccination, after vaccination was 1 to 5 days in 85%, 6 to 15 days in 13%, and more than 15 days in 2%, with the maximum duration for one individual being uh, 182 days. For serious adverse events, overall the rate was 1% in both the vaccine and placebo groups. However, among vaccine recipients, 0.1% or two of the events were uh, considered related compared with none in the placebo recipients. So the key points the work group noted from the initial review of the data are that there are a total of approximately 3,500 adults with data from two phase three trials, including the pivotal phase three study that um, I summarized and the lot-to-lot -lot consistency study that also had similar results uh, in, take, in terms of rates of adverse events. Overall, adverse events and severe adverse events occurred at significantly higher rates in vaccine recipients compared with placebo recipients. In regards to this reactogenicity, local reactions were reported at low rates, overall reported by 15% of vaccinated subjects in the pivotal phase three trial, with rates of individual events almost all lower than 6%. However, solicited systemic reactions were reported by 50% of subjects, which was about twice the rate reported among placebo recipients. Arthralgia is an adverse event of interest, um, in regards to chikungunya vaccine and was reported by 17% of vaccine recipients. Serious adverse events were uncommon, but there were an insufficient number of subjects in the trials to detect rare serious adverse events. And finally, I want to reiterate that with the work group only forming in recent months, we have only had the chance for a preliminary review of these data, but we plan to review the data in far more depth during the grade assessment. So to conclude the session, I want to describe the work group's timeline and future plans. This slide shows an outline of the current plan timeline for work group activities and presentations to ACIP. The key points are that in association with the vaccine's likely licensure during 2023, the work group plans to present the evidence to recommendations framework at the October 2023 ACIP meeting with a vote at the following meeting in February 2024. So today has been a broad introduction to chikungunya and the Valneva vaccine, the first chikungunya vaccine that's likely to be licensed in the United States. However, there are a number of other important topics that the work group plans to present at future ACIP meetings, as they are important as vaccine recommendations are considered. We'll present more detailed information on the epidemiology of chikungunya among travelers and among residents of United States areas with past transmission of chikungunya virus and more in-depth information on acute disease and disease burden from sequelae of infection. We also plan to comprehensively review the vaccine immunogenicity and safety data as part of the grade assessment. And finally, we anticipate over time that there will be additional data on use of Valneva's vaccine among younger age groups, and there might be additional chikungunya vaccines submitted for licensure in the United States. And we'll be presenting those data as they become available. So to conclude, I want to acknowledge the very hard work of the Chikungunya Vaccines Workgroup members. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and I will hand back to Dr. Lee. Thank you so much, Dr. Hills. Um, I will open this question, the, open this presentation for questions, and we'll start with Dr. Cotton. Thanks very much for a presentation of very interesting data. I was wondering if there will be eventually work done looking at concomitant vaccines, you know, in the travel clinic setting or perhaps the military setting, thinking about giving things like yellow fever vaccine with this live viral um, vaccine and if there are thoughts or concerns about that, or do you have any insights? Um, I do, but perhaps I will um, hand over to Valneva for, to comment on that from what they are planning um, at this point. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, indeed, this is a topic of consideration for us, and we haven't quite solidified our plans yet, uh, but uh, we are aware that uh, such data may be useful for the, for the use within the travel vaccine setting. All right, uh, any further comments? 
Uh, Dr. Long. Um, yes, it's a little bit of an indirect question. Um, has the work group thought about these things? In the travelers, they probably have not had previous dengue infection, but if used in endemic regions, the two viruses, although they're different families, they, they occur in, in the same areas, and people may have had preceding infections with dengue, for instance, before they get this vaccine. And I know there's cross-reactivity in enzyme immunoassays, probably not neutralization assays. But the question is, are you going to be at all concerned about the performance of the vaccine in those who previously have had dengue or previously have had um, chikungunya in enhancement of disease or detrimental response to vaccine or adverse events? Thank you for that question, Dr. Long. Um, because uh, dengue is a flavivirus and chikungunya is an alpha virus, we're not concerned about that in interaction. Um, however, um, one of the questions of relevance to your question is, is thinking about um, response in people who have had previous uh, chikungunya or perhaps other alpha virus infections. So uh, Mayaro occurs in um, South America, and Nyong Nyong occurs in Africa, Ross River and Barma Forest um, occur in some regions um, in the Pacific. Um, and as we move ahead, um, we will be uh, uh, thinking about um, those data. So thank you very much for that reminder and that question. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. I just have one small question. If this is a non-reproducing virus, will you be looking at use of this in immunocompromised patients? I actually understand the hesitancy in pregnant women to give a live viral vaccine, um, but immunocompromised is different. Uh, so I, I believe um, immunocompromised will be a contraindication to vaccination, but I would like um, Val Neighbor to comment on that. Yeah, so just to, to uh, quickly answer, yes, indeed, we, we expect that uh, severe immunocompromisation will be a contraindication to receiving the live vaccine, and uh, it, it is a replicating virus vaccine. Uh, however, there is, uh, there is also considerations that uh, the use of this vaccine may be, um, may be prudent in some subgroups um, that, uh, for example, um, HIV positive individuals, uh, there may be studies on those topics in the future. And uh, so I think this is uh, more um, data that we'll uh, probably have uh, at some later stage. Thank you. So just to be clear, it's attenuated with the reverse genetics and that um, 60 amino acid deletion, but it can still um, replicate. Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. That makes don't then don't put it in immunocompromised yet. <laughs> yes. Or or pregnant woman. Yeah. <laughs> Just stop those ideas. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? Dr. Hills, I just have one, um, you know, question clarification for where the work group is headed, and you know, uh, as with many of our vaccines that uh, serve. Uh, unique populations with uncertain exposures. Um, do you have a sense, uh, or maybe um, I'll just ask if perhaps the work group can consider some of the discussion before that we've had around clearly defining risk-based groups and or whether or not shared clinical decision makes sense, shared clinical decision making makes sense. But it, I think this is the hardest question of all. And I feel like for these groups where it's not totally always clear um, who's at highest risk and when they'll be at highest risk, it'll be really helpful to have as much guidance as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. We'll, we will definitely take that on board. Thank you, everyone. So I don't see any other hands raised. I, we are going to break for lunch, and um, we are running behind schedule. I'm going to try and give us till about 1.30. Uh, so uh, please feel free to join us back online around 1.30.